Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, Chatham House. Uh, it's a real pleasure this evening to welcome Sir John Holmes, uh, a, a colleague uh, formerly in the Foreign Office, uh, but latterly also a colleague uh, in the United Nations. Uh, as many of you may know, John spent uh, perhaps the largest part of his career in the FCO. Uh, he was a principal foreign advisor to two prime ministers, uh, Sir John Major and Tony Blair. Um, and his career in the Foreign Office, I think, finished when you were ambassador in France. In fact, I remember coming to the uh, residence one evening, John, a very cold evening in January when I was attending some uh, donors conference in Paris on behalf of the Secretary General. And I think it was just before you were finally making up your mind to go to uh, the Department of Humanitarian Affairs as uh, Under Secretary General. Well, the good news, and I don't know whether I had any part in it myself, probably not, is that you did take up that job. Um, and between 2007 and 2010, you were the Under Secretary General for uh, Humanitarian uh, Affairs. Uh, during that period, you traveled relentlessly and to some of the most difficult uh, humanitarian situations uh, in the world, in Sudan, of course, both in the south and in uh, Darfur, and in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Sri Lanka, uh, and in uh, Somalia. Um, these were very, very difficult days, and all of the major conflicts that posed uh, great issues for the UN, uh, and especially for your department. Recently, you've uh, written this uh, memoir, this reflection, on your years in, in the UN, uh, the politics of humanity. Um, and I, I, I thought that was a particularly apt title uh, because the humanitarian field, as all of us who've worked in it uh, in different uh, countries uh, over the years know, is often all too heavily uh, politicized and uh, militarized. John? I'll give you the floor now, and we look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you very much to Chatham House for hosting this event, and, and thank you very much to all of you for, for coming along. Uh, the theme, obviously, as you're aware, is humanitarian aid and the role of government, which is, um, to a large extent, the theme of the, the book uh, that Michael was just referring to, which is about my time at the UN between 2007 and 2010. Before I get on to talking about the theme, I just thought I might try to put what we are talking about in context, because I think it's important to get that right. And I think the starting point for that is to try to make the mental leap to put yourself in the place of a person who is in the middle of a disaster, whether it be a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, obviously a conflict of some kind. Uh, and it's actually quite difficult. I think the nearest most of us are likely to come to it uh, if we're lucky, in a comfortable country like this, is the sudden loss, uh, the sudden death, if you like, of someone very close to you, a spouse or, or a child, when all of a sudden the world is turned upside down, when all the familiar anchors in your world uh, seem to have gone, and what mattered so much yesterday no longer seems to matter at all today. And if you multiply that several times, uh, when not only you've, uh, a member of your family may have uh, been killed, uh, but also your friends and your neighbours um, are killed and scattered, your house is gone, your village is gone, your livelihood is gone, your life, uh, in short, is completely upside down. And on top of that, you don't know where you're going to find anything to eat uh, or drink. You don't know where you're going to find someone who's going to help you uh, care for your injuries or for the injuries of those close to you, and you haven't got anywhere warm and dry to sleep. In other words, everything that was familiar and stable in your life has disappeared, and you have no idea what your future is going to be, and when, if ever, normality uh, is going to return to your life. As I say, it's very tough to imagine what that must be really like, sitting, as we do, in a, in a comfortable and stable country. And I'm not sure I can really, even now, after four years of living it uh, on a daily basis, um, make that leap. But the point is that many millions of people every year are in this kind of desperate state, and each of them is an individual with his, own, uh, his or her own grief, and his or her own story to tell. 
And each of them wouldn't have found it any easier than you to conceive of it happening to them before it actually did. Uh, the latest and most uh, visible people to find themselves in this position are, of course, those affected by the dreadful civil war now raging in Syria. More than a million people have fled the country to Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan uh, and elsewhere, uh, and several million more are internally displaced. And many of those are in a terrible plight. Uh, again, their world's been turned upside down. And the international community is not, in fact, in this case, I think so far anyway, responding with the resources needed despite the publicity given to it. But I was quite struck, and I went to Jordan a few months ago with the International Rescue Committee to, to see some of the uh, Syrian refugees in Jordan by the kind of thing they said to me. Uh, and what they said very often was, this sort of thing doesn't happen to people like us, uh, not Syrians. We're, the, we're accustomed to giving other people help. We're accustomed to giving other people shelter. We're not the ones who should be desperate for help. And we hate this situation of depending on the generosity of others in the world. We can't believe... That's where we've got to. But that's where they were. And they and those like them around the world really do desperately need our help. And if I emphasize this right at the beginning, that's because this is the uncomfortable reality behind what the book is about. Um, uh, and I apologize if what I'm going to say is a little bit, um, it's not very light, uh, not necessarily very amusing, but the subject doesn't e easily lend itself to that. So most of it uh, is rather serious. In any case, the point is that this underlying misery and desperation is what we always need to have in our, in our heads, in our minds, when we start to talk about the, the drier points of humanitarian policy and about relations between governments and humanitarians. And it's also this very uh, difficult and unpleasant reality, which is uh, the reason why the four basic principles behind the successful delivery of humanitarian aid are so vital. That is, humanity, the compassion we all need to give uh, to resources and to help. Independence, that is independence from any consideration of politics or race or religion or anything else. Impartiality towards those who need assistance, so that must be based purely on need, not on anything else. And finally, neutrality. In other words, neutrality between the warring factions, whoever they may be if there's a conflict, and whatever we may think of their causes or indeed of them uh, as individuals. And the point is, in my experience, governments and others didn't always understand or want to understand those principles, both governments who were at the receiving end of, of aid and sometimes even the donor governments. And that's why the situations I describe in the book became so difficult to manage at different times. Perhaps I should just say how I, uh, uh, a long-serving British diplomat, as, as Michael said, how did I get into all this in the first place? Because, and that's where I really start the book, explaining why... I was an accidental humanitarian. The point is I was leaving Paris where, as Michael said, I'd been ambassador for a few years and I really wasn't sure what was going to happen next when I got a call from Tony Blair, who was then the Prime Minister, and who was looking for someone to be the senior British person in the UN Secretariat uh, in New York. Now, he wanted me to be the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, which is natural, obviously, in with my background, and that was also a position which British diplomats had held uh, with great distinction for many years. However, when I went to see the Secretary General designate, designate Ban, Ban Ki-moon in New York, uh, I discovered that that job wasn't actually available for various reasons, though they'd actually offered it to the Americans. And so he offered me the role of Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs instead. Uh, and I said, well, that's very interesting, Secretary General, but I know nothing about humanitarian affairs. Uh, in any case, I think I'm the wrong nationality. You know, the, the British was not long after Iraq, obviously, the, the British have been going around the place killing people quite a lot, so you know, I'm not sure we're going to be very, I'm going to be well, well, well regarded in this uh, position. You need a more cuddly nationality. You, know, you need a, a, a Dutchman or a Norwegian or a Swede. Um, but anyway, he didn't, uh, he didn't accept that argument, and he insisted that I should at least consider it. And then I talked to other people who knew a little bit about this, perhaps people like Michael, as he said, uh, and learned the value and opportunity which the job offered, so eventually uh, I accepted it. And I hadn't regretted it, uh, despite the horrors and difficulties it did bring me into contact with over the following four years, and I, I did learn a huge amount. But also, when I finished the job in 2010, I just felt that I had to, to write bits of it down uh, in a way I'd never felt about my foreign office career, uh, although that was uh, fascinating at times as well. Now, the essence of the job, just to sort of make it clear, um, of emergency relief coordinator is to ensure that humanitarian relief 
is well coordinated and effective and is available wherever it's needed in terms of cash and the right people. Uh, why was such a coordinating role required at all? Well, that's because the humanitarian system, as those of you who engage in it will know, is not really a system at all, uh, but is a very fragmented collection of different organizations, UN agencies, the Red Cross family, uh, and many, many NGOs, all working uh, in the same sort of area. They're all well-intentioned, and uh, most of them are extremely effective, but they're also all independent, and they have overlapping mandates, they have overlapping responsibilities, and sometimes very different ideas about what's needed. So bringing this cacophony together, if you like, making the whole at least equal to the sum of its parts was the key task of the emergency relief coordinator. And one of the key points of that was that I had no ability to give anybody any orders, uh, no authority over them. The only levers were uh, my capacity to persuade um, these organizations that they needed to work together and, of course, the recognition of the organizations themselves that they needed to be coordinated if it was going to be effective. Now, what is the, the, the book actually about? I mean, we explore in depth some basic policy themes, um, famine and food insecurity, the rights and wrongs of humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect, which is obviously very relevant to where we are in Syria, and we could talk about that, no doubt. Uh, accountability for abuses and uh, not least the role of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the need to focus on prevention of disasters rather than just response after they happen and the future needs and nature of humanitarian assistance. I also talk a little bit about reforms uh, in recent years to the way that humanitarian aid is organized and coordinated. I think there has been a lot of progress in uh, improving and professional, professionalizing the performance of humanitarian aid uh, in recent years, but that's a rather technical subject which I'm certainly not going to go into now. But most of the book is actually devoted to disasters and conflicts in individual countries or territories in, in some cases, which particularly preoccupied me when I was doing the job and which uh, I spent a lot of time visiting because, as Michael said, I was traveling about half of the time. And I wrote it this way with these practical examples, uh, not because it's important to say what I did or didn't do, that's not the idea, but because I wanted to use these down-to-earth experiences, if you like, to illustrate these policy dilemmas about humanitarian policy, this link between politics and humanitarianism in a practical way rather than simply pontificating in theory about it. So that's why I have chapters on the conflict in Darfur, the travails of southern Sudan and its eventual emergence into independence, the end of the war between the government and the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, sufferings in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, particularly in the east, and uh, I say quite a lot about the scourge of sexual violence there and the horrors of the presence of the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, the long-running civil war in Somalia, uh, Cyclone Nargis in Myanmar, Burma in 2008, the Israeli intervention in Gaza in early 2009, Operation Cast Lead, the earthquake in Haiti in early 2010, and then the humanitarian consequences of both conflict and natural disasters in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And all of these provide, I think, uh, interesting examples of where the humanitarian imperative run up against the political realities in very difficult ways. And I'm going to touch briefly uh, on five of them, just to give you a flavor uh, of how this really worked. That's Darfur, uh, in Western Sudan, Sri Lanka, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, and Myanmar, Burma. And I'll try to do that without taking all the time. Um, first of all, in Darfur, which I think many of you will be familiar with, where the conflict between the rebels and the government had started in 2003 and quickly displaced well over 2 million people, about a third of the population. And the international community mounted what is still the single biggest humanitarian operation in the world, uh, costing more than a billion pounds a year, to keep the displaced people alive pending resolution of the conflict. And by the time I got there in, nine, in 2007, uh, there was not really a hot war going on. It was more of a messy and violent stalemate with very little opportunity for the people uh, involved to go home. Uh, they were in camps, one camp alone in South Darfur. I remember Kalma camp had more than 100,000 people crammed into it, into a small area with no land to cultivate. And they were perpetually in dispute or conflict with the local authorities there. Uh, there was a very violent situation uh, and uh, our own staff, our own OTCHA staff were very much involved in that. Indeed, one of them was expelled by the government because of it. 
Now, there's also a big humanitarian community on the ground in Darfur. There's about 14,000 people working for UN agencies and the Red Cross and NGOs, including about 1,000 international expatriate workers. And this community faced constant and increasing pressure from the government in Khartoum. They disliked their presence as witnesses to what was going on, and they disliked their insistence in involving themselves not only in providing the basics of food and clean water and medical care, in other words, the, the basics of life, but also in trying to protect the civilian population against all abuses of all kinds, uh, including abuses by the government themselves and including sexual violence, which was essentially a taboo subject. And I spent a lot of time during those four years visiting Darfur, visiting Khartoum, to try to put pressure on the central government, but also on the local governments in, in Darfur, to let the humanitarian community do what we were actually there to do, which was to help the people uh, who were in most need. And this was a very difficult, and I have to say, very unsatisfactory dialogue. We sometimes made steps forward, but we usually had just as many steps backward. And this culminated in March 2009, with the expulsion by the Khartoum government of 13 NGOs, including some of the big international players like Oxfam. Ostensibly because they've been indulging in unspecified, unacceptable behavior. But in fact, really because the president, President Bashir, had just been indicted by the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity. And humanitarian organizations, some rather outspoken uh, in reality, were a doubly convenient whipping boy to use for retaliation. They weren't able to hit back, uh, but they're also good to get out of the way with their inconvenient and embarrassing statements and activities at times. And this expulsion was also incidentally done in a very brutal manner with threats, intimidation, and seizure of equipment and documents, uh, again, in a very unacceptable way. And the dilemma was how to react to this. There's a choice, essentially, I guess, between pulling out all the humanitarian organizations in protest against this kind of unacceptable action and the unacceptable conditions this was creating for those still working in Darfur and staying in Darfur, staying in Sudan, while trying to reverse the decision, however hopeless that might be, and meanwhile trying to stop a second, even worse humanitarian disaster in, uh, in Darfur because of the capacity to help on the ground that had been lost because of the expulsions. Now, we decided in the end to stay in despite the provocation of the expulsion, and try to improve things by dialogue, however difficult again, but also using political pressure from governments and institutions like the Arab League, who might be considered to have some influence in Khartoum. And that decision to stay in was controversial at the time, and only partially successful, I have to say. We did, in fact, largely prevent another uh, major humanitarian crisis, uh, but it was, uh, we never managed to establish a very satisfactory basis for operations with the Sudanese government, and I think that remains the case today. So should we actually have drawn a line in the sand and pulled out altogether and face the Sudanese government with the real consequences of their decision and force them to face up to it? Maybe that's an issue uh, we can debate. Some of you may have been familiar with it at the time. But meanwhile, just to say, the Darfur crisis has not been resolved. It's disappeared largely from our TV screens and our newspapers, uh, and that illustrates one of the main frustrations uh, that I felt and many others felt in these kind of situations in Darfur and elsewhere, that the political actors, whether the ones actually engaged in the conflict or the international actors trying to act on this from outside, have failed to take advantage of the breathing space, the sticking plaster, as if you like, that the humanitarians put on the situation, and left us literally holding the baby uh, because they failed to resolve the conflict. And even worse, was left us in a position where we're in danger of seeming to contribute towards prolonging the conflict by dealing with its humanitarian consequences because we're sparing the warring parties uh, the, the reality the, uh, from facing the realities of what they've done. And what we're also doing after 10 years, without of course meaning to, is creating a whole generation of aid dependent people uh, who will uh, find it very difficult to go home uh, in the future. Now, secondly, Sri Lanka, this is like Darfur still a live issue, although the conflict uh, is itself over. And it's again, it's somewhere I visited a lot uh, over the, the four years between 2007 and 2010. But the particular context here was what happened in northeast Sri Lanka in the first months of 2009, when the government forces finally defeated the LTTE Tamil Tiger rebels. Up to 300,000 Tamil civilians were with the LTTE right to the end, mostly held against their will by the LTTE, and effectively used as a kind of human shield uh, 
as the, the, the fighting forces of the Tamil Tigers with these civilians retreated into an ever smaller area, enclave, um, under pressure from the military pressure from the government. And while the LTT themselves was, were firing on any civilians trying to escape and were effectively uh, committing war crimes in, in doing so, the government forces were also using heavy weapons and airstrikes in areas where they knew these uh, uh, Tamil civilians were and where they knew there were bound to be many deaths and injuries. And there were deaths and injuries, thousands of them, perhaps tens of thousands of them, before the eventual total defeat of the LTTE and the eventual release of the emaciated and disease-ridden civilian survivors. Now, there were very few witnesses, international witnesses, I mean, to what was actually happening, and virtually no aid, because the journalists and the humanitarian workers had been excluded from this LTTE-held area at an earlier stage. And this led to a series of controversies which continue to rage and which I go into uh, in the book. Should the humanitarian community have pulled out of this area uh, when the government told them they needed to in September 2008, or should we have tried to stay longer? Should we have condemned the government even more loudly and publicly than we did, and given even more loudly and publicly than we did details of the civilian casualties in the LTT-held area to increase international outrage, if you like, even when we weren't sure of how reliable these figures actually were? Indeed, more fundamentally, should we have gone on working with the government behaving that way at all and pulled out of the country altogether as a form of protest? Now, there isn't time to go into these controversies, but I believed, and I still believe, that we were right to hang in there despite all this and to do what we could do to influence the government from within as well as from without, while attempting to look after the Tamils who did escape from the LTTE and, of course, the rest of the Tamil population when they eventually got out. Because we were a large part, uh, we did play a large part in ensuring that the Tamil civilians were properly treated after the war, physically and psychologically, and that they were able to return to their homes after a few months rather than being kept in camps for years, as looked likely at one stage. This decision to stay in there and to work to help to mo the most vulnerable was, uh, despite my own experiences at the hands of the government a couple of years before, uh, when on a visit, a, a minister went so far as to describe me as a terrorist after I'd said that Sri Lanka at the time was the most dangerous place in the world for humanitarian workers after a, a massacre of humanitarian workers in there. I actually got it in the neck from both sides because uh, some people in the Tamil diaspora also called me a con conniver in genocide. Um, maybe if you get it from both sides, uh, you might be getting something right, I suppose. But the point is, anyway, there was certainly room, again, for genuine debate about what we should have done in those circumstances. Should we have stayed or should we have gone? Should we have continued to work with the government, however difficult that was, or should we have denounced them more actively? Is the humanitarian community ever capable of setting red lines about its own presence, or will we always be driven to stay in there, almost whatever happens, to try to help the most vulnerable people? Our third Afghanistan, um, again, there's no time to go into the details of what is a very complex situation. But the essence of the problem there, as many of you will be aware, was the blurring of lines between political and security objectives and activities and humanitarian object objectives and activities. I think the nadir of all this came when US troops said at one stage that villages cooperating in the fight against the Taliban would be given humanitarian help, but those who didn't would not. That was obviously completely unacceptable. But, but the whole situation was very difficult for the United Nations because they had a mandate from the Security Council to support the government after 2001, and therefore their activities became very easily confused and mixed up with those of NATO and the military operation. There was then an, an extra problem for the humanitarians within the UN because how could they separate themselves from the rest of the UN and therefore, by extension, from NATO without being seen by the locals, including by the Taliban and other militias, as just one uh, Western ball of wax, if I can put it that way, thus jeopardizing our ability to operate safely and effectively. Because the point was that humanitarians were increasingly being attacked and targeted uh, in, in Afghanistan in a way they had not been before, even when the Taliban were in power before 2001. Now, th this came to a head, in a way, in my time as emergency relief coordinator, because uh, coordination of humanitarian activities uh, in Afghanistan had been put inside the UN mission um, uh, generally. 
And we decided at that point, this is in 2009, that we simply had to separate ourselves out from that UN mission and establish a separate op op office physically and, of course, organizationally. Now, it sounds a bit trivial, perhaps. Maybe it sounds rather simple. But actually, this caused huge ructions within the UN and within the UN mission who couldn't see the logic of what we wanted to do and thought we were just being precious and over-innocent. And we got little or no support from the Western governments involved either, even those who are usually sympathetic to humanitarian causes because they simply seemed unable to grasp this need for us to be able to operate independently and impartially if we were to do our job properly or indeed do our job at all. And there was also a separate huge issue about our desire to talk to the Taliban as humanitarians, not on a political front, in order to persuade them to respect humanitarian principles and again, let us do our job. Now, we did eventually succeed in persuading everybody uh, to let us set up a, notch, a, a separate OCHA office, OCHA being the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. But that problem of confusion of roles between military and political actors and humanitarian and development actors and their respective responsibilities has considered, and it's been added to, of course, by a wider tension between the United Nations and NATO about civilian casualties, which has also not gone away. I'm conscious I'm running out of time. Uh, perhaps I will skip over the, the, the DRC, but we can talk about it, the, the, the uh, Congo, uh, because uh, that's a very complex situation and I don't want to, to skip over it without doing it justice. So let me just turn finally to a natural disaster a situation, which is usually rather more simple. And this is the natural disaster in Myanmar, Burma, uh, in May 2008, when Cyclone Nargis hit and a massive tidal surge caused the death of 140,000 people in the Irrawaddy Delta in the space uh, of a few hours. And a further two million people were displaced and desperately needed help. But the Myanmar regime at the time refused for weeks to allow international aid workers into the country. They obviously feared, because they were paranoid about the international community at the time, that these humanitarian workers would in reality be CIA agents or, or even worse, Western journalists. Um, so they took a lot of persuading, first of all by myself uh, on a visit and then by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, that the needs of the people affected by the cyclone were so desperate uh, that they had no choice but to accept outside help. And that, more importantly, we were not, not attaching any political conditions to this help. Now, our cause in trying to persuade the government to accept international help was not assisted, I have to say, by some loose talk from Western capitals not actually London, but uh, one close to here, that if the regime wouldn't accept aid voluntarily, it should somehow be forced to do so at gunpoint. Now, in practice, intervention was not a realistic option in this situation in any, in any, uh, in any way, mm -hmm. and talking about it in that way simply fed the paranoia of the regime and didn't influence the situation in a helpful way. And at the time, also, much of the press and some Western governments were not convinced it was possible to have a sensible or productive dialogue uh, with such a re uh, regime. I believe there was no choice faced with such hum huge humanitarian need and that the regime could be brought to see sense if they were approached in the right way. Now, in the end, that was what more or less did happen, uh, not least perhaps because uh, Ban Ki-moon was able to talk to them as a fellow Asian and convince them of the UN's goodwill. And we were also able to use the association of Southeastern nations, uh, ASEAN, as a way into the decision makers in, uh, in the capital. I actually like to think that this ultimately successful experience of persuading them to allow the aid workers in may have played a small part uh, in beginning to open a crack in the defenses of, uh, of a regime which had hitherto been pretty impenetrable. In any case, as you know, the situation has changed out of all recognition for the better, uh, and that's a very uh, desirable uh, outcome. Now, just to conclude quickly, uh, um, and if you want to know more about these situations, obviously you'll need to read the book. Um, what conclusions do I draw from these experiences? Let me just single out five quickly. First of all, governments, both from donor nations and more particularly from countries where humanitarian operations are conducted, need to understand much better than they do now and respect much more than they do now the principles according to which humanitarians have to work to be effective. This also means humanitarians have to explain them much better uh, why they're necessary, and that's, of course, one of the aims uh, of the book. Secondly, talking to governments and to non-state actors, even ones other people identify as terrorists, is almost always better than shouting at them, certainly for humanitarians, but perhaps 
This is a wider point, no doubt, for others as well. Now, the right balance between maintaining operations and louder denunciation of local governments or rebel movements is always hard. But I believe it has to be struck pragmatically and according to the specific political context, which means the nuances and dynamics of that context need to be properly understood, which is not always the case. Thirdly, so-called humanitarian intervention, in other words, armed intervention to protect populations from their own governments in accordance with the responsibility to protect, has to be approached with huge care. And knowledge of the, again, knowledge of the politics of the country where intervention is being contemplated is essential, and again, including the nuances of the situation, because the unintended consequences of intervention are often so great and so negative that it really has to be a last, last resort. This is, of course, again, as I said, a very live issue now in Syria. Fourthly, and I haven't talked much about this, but it's very important, preventing natural disasters and reducing the risks from them when they do strike has to be given a much higher priority than we are giving it now compared to responding with help after they strike. And that needs to be both by the governments of the countries concerned, but also by the international humanitarian and development community. We need to spend much more time on building local capacity in disaster-prone countries to deal with their own disasters as much as possible. And this approach focused on disaster risk reduction, uh, to use the jargon, and local capacity building should be the model for humanitarianism in the future. A final point, um, a final conclusion, there is going, still going to be a need, even if we move to this model of uh, disaster risk reduction, local capacity building, there's still going to be a need for more international resources and more international humanitarian capacity to deal not only with conflicts, but also particularly, I think, with the major natural disasters, which are going to be increasing both in frequency and intensity because of the increasing effects of climate change. And some of those, even the best prepared local governments will not be able to deal with. And I think that providing those resources will remain a worthwhile cause worthy of our support. And I hope the book will help to persuade you of that as well. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, John. Um, I should have said at the beginning that we had hoped that Kitty Arry, uh, the director of Adv advocacy at Save the Children, was going to join us. But this morning, um, we were told that she, uh, she alas, couldn't uh, join the meeting. Um, John, thanks for, for what you uh, spoken to, an extraordinary landscape of humanitarian crises over the last uh, four years and your involvement in, in all of them. Um, but before I open it up, and I'm, I'm sure there are lots of questions to you, w one thing you, you talked about was the political context and the need to engage with all the parties to uh, conflicts and so on. I mean, how realistic is that sometimes with groups like the Taliban, um, the Tamil Tigers. Um, we, we talked earlier outside about you know, Cambodia in the 80s and 90s and the, the, the Khmer Rouge. Um, one sees the necessity of trying to engage with these partners. The reality is, though, uh, are so daunting and, uh, uh, that it's difficult to make that engagement, isn't it? It's difficult, but it, it does happen in some places and it does happen successfully. Um, before 2001, uh, there was a lot of engagement with the Taliban by the humanitarian community, mm -hmm. which I think helped to make sure that humanitarian aid could reach the people uh, who needed it. Um, that was also true to some extent in Pakistan, with the, the, the Taliban on the Pakistan side of the border, at least until the military operations there started on a large scale by the Pakistan government. Um, and that's been true elsewhere, and, and organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is obviously it's much easier for them to be neutral than for a UN agency, which is always a little bit tainted by the, by the UN's political role at the same time. They've often had this uh, ability to engage with, uh, with liberation movements, if, if you want to call them that. Other people might call them terrorists in some cases. Uh, and to, to work with both sides in a very private way um, in order to establish the conditions to it, enable them to operate. And this idea of getting consent from the local populations and consent from whatever organization is in charge of a particular area mm. is actually fundamental to the way that humanitarians try to work. Now, as I say, it, 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 it is very difficult. It didn't, uh, it broke down in Afghanistan, not yeah. least because the, those, uh, the Americans and the British and others didn't want us to do that. Uh, because they feared it might give legitimacy to the Taliban, which I can understand but, but don't agree with. Right. 
And in some other areas, like, for example, Somalia, where we wanted to talk to the, the, the Shabab movement, um, we found that very difficult. There were conversations, and they did have some effects. But the Shabab, and this is a, very often a problem, was so fragmented mm. without any leadership, without any coordination, that an agreement you reached here with one local leader mm. was not necessarily going to be respected there by mm. another. Uh, so, you know, you did have quite considerable problems. But, but my, you know, I had these arguments a lot with, with political and peacekeeping colleagues in the UN who said you can't really distinguish yourself from us, you're wasting your time, it's, a, it's not worth it. Uh, my argument was that just because it's difficult to do isn't a reason for not doing it. We just need to try harder to persuade them that you know, even when you're the UN and you're humanitarian, you should be treated differently um, from, the, from the rest of the, the UN uh, and from, these, you know, from the West as a political actor. That one of the problems is that you know, even for NGOs, which are not part of the UN, they're usually based in the West, Correct. so they tend to get lumped together as a sort of part of a Western intervention uh, mode, however ridiculous that mi might be. But again, in my view, that's a reason for trying hard and not for giving up. Very good. Um, let's open it up to questions. Uh, we've got a microphone, so if you wait before um, you put your question, and please identify yourself and your name and uh, organization. Gentleman here in the middle. So John, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, you mentioned the four categories that uh, input into humanitarian uh, aid. Um, and you also mentioned uh, the UK's recent military and political involvement in conflicts. Uh, and you touched on the sort of the UN slightly tricky situation because of its political aspects in terms of providing humanitarian aid. In that context, um, can uh, the Department for International Development be a humanitarian actor? Um, and depending on your answer to that, what, what does that mean for the various humanitarian organizations that receive uh, significant amounts of funding from, from DFID? Well, I think it, I mean, it is a humanitarian actor in the sense that it's quite a big funder of, of uh, humanitarian assistance, both through the UN and, and through NGOs, and indeed, to some extent, uh, parts of the Red Cross, I think. So, I mean, it is an actor uh, in that way, and of course it does have people on the ground in, uh, in some of these places to try and make sure this money is being correctly spent. Now, the, the, the risk is that where they're operating, for example, as a development agency, I mean, not so much on the humanitarian side, but a development agency, in a place like Afghanistan where British troops are also on the ground, do they get sucked into the, the wider agenda? Um, I mean, I think they're very conscious of that, uh, they're very conscious of the need to avoid being um, just serving some security and political objective. They're trying to do it on the basis of, uh, of need, whether it be humanitarian or, or development work. Um, I mean, there's a political reality there that um, while overall aid needs to be uh, related to need, not anything else, uh, if you want to justify aid to the wider population... Uh, there is a, uh, you know, there's a sort of, not an imperative, but there's a, a motivation, if, if you like, to put a little bit more aid into Afghanistan or in different circumstances in the past, into Iraq or wherever, where your troops are, because you, you want to make an ex extra effort to stabilize the place so that the, the troops can then leave. Now, as I say, the risk is that you get what everybody, you know, what's known in the jargon, is militarization of aid. I would say that so far they have avoided that risk for the most part. But it is a risk, um, and the more you're trying to justify a large aid spend by, by its practical effects, you know, if, effects and benefits for the wider population of your own country, the more you're likely to get sucked into that, and the more you demand results which can be, which can be um, measured in ways which are you know, obvious to the people of the taxpayers, again, there's a risk that you get sucked into something which is going to be unacceptable. I, I think they've stayed the right side of the line, but I think it's important that the NGOs, maybe like your own organization, but also like all the development and, and uh, humanitarian NGOs, try and keep them honest in this respect and keep the pressure on to make sure it doesn't get uh, diverted in, in unacceptable directions. Gentleman right at the back. Then. Hello, uh, Tim with Albion from King's College London. Um, I mean, you argued that we need a separation between humanitarian aid and the political and military side. Um, but couldn't exactly this stance be what is perpetuating humanitarian crisis? Um, because, let's face it, humanitarian aid is in a political context. So 
you, you mentioned Darfur, you mentioned Afghanistan. Uh, in Afghanistan, one of the big problems is that the aid is being bypassed, not through the government, but through aid agencies and thereby undermining legitimacy in Darfur. Um, because you try to kind of disconnect it from political situations, I mean, or in other situations, the, the refugee camps, I mean, they're not refugee camps anymore. I mean, they basically became tent cities and they're, they're there to stay. So couldn't this actually be hurting the people who are needing assistance? Well, there's quite a lot of questions in one there, I think. Um, I mean, the, the problem as I, as I saw it and as I see it is that you are trying to deliver humanitarian aid in a non-political way, in other words, just based purely on need, if it's a conflict, in a very political situation. I mean, and, and you know, some of these situations are some of the most highly politicized situations you can imagine, whether it be Darfur, Gaza is even more difficult from that in that respect, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and so on. So... The humanitarians need to be very aware of what the political context is in which they're operating, and they need to be able to move in that world and find their way. And what they need to make sure they're not doing is being instrumentalized by any of the actors uh, in that situation to give humanitarian aid for reasons other than pure need. Now, there's a second question about, well, you know, even if you're doing that reasonably successfully, isn't what you're doing, doesn't what you're doing have some political significance at the end of the day? That's much more difficult. Um, I mean, to take your example of Darfur, uh, the people were in the camps, um, and we were accused by the government of wanting to keep them in the camps um, because, well, they, they argued because we, want, we wanted a job, you know, humanitarians needed a job, which was ludicrous, but they also argued that somehow we were on the side of the rebels. Now, what was true was that the people in the camps um, were the people from whom the rebels came, uh, I mean in tribal terms anyway, if you like, um, and that uh, as time went on, the camps themselves became quite politicized. So I would go to a camp in Darfur um, and try to just talk to ordinary people in the camp, uh, but what the people said was being dictated to them by some of the rebel leaders who were very influential in the camp. So it was very difficult to get behind that. So, you know, you were, you were, you were getting sucked into politics because the people would say not that, you know, we need more clean water or, or, or firewood collection is difficult or whatever. They did say that as well. But they'd also say what the international community should do is arrest President Bashir and bring him to trial by the International Criminal Court and get rid of this dictator forever. To which I had to say, you know, that's not my job. Uh, you know, my job is to make sure that the humanitarian is provided, uh, aid is provided as, as neutrally as, and effectively as possible. So it's that problem of maintaining your balance uh, as a humanitarian um, actor in a very, very highly politicized context where everything you do can seem to have significance without losing that balance. Now, do we always get it right? I mean, sh certainly not. It's very difficult in those circumstances. Uh, and just to continue with the discussion about Darfur for a second, I mean, the government wanted people to go home. They said, why aren't they going home from these camps? We don't want them in these camps. You know, they are becoming aid dependent and so on. But that itself was a political statement. They wanted to pretend that the conflict was ended when it wasn't. And we had to say, we want them to go home too, but you can't send them home until it's safe to do so. So we're not going to press them to leave and we'll continue to aid them where they are. But again, you know, you're, you're, you're walking a tightrope uh, is my point. And that's, uh, I think a lot of situations are very like that. Um, now, this event is being live streamed, uh, so I think we may have a question. Sarah? Yep, hi. Um, it comes from one of our followers, Dr. Stephen Hurt, and his question is, what impact do you think the rise of emerging donors will have on the politics of aid? Do you catch that? Yes, what impact will the rise of emerging donors have on this debate? I mean, I think that there are two things, or several things there. One is that... Um, for the moment, most humanitarian aid is financed by a, I mean, leaving aside what ordinary people give, which is very important to NGOs and so on, is financed by a very small group of countries, Western donors. Probably a, a dozen donors give 90, 95% of what's actually given internationally. Um, how long is that sustainable? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, DFID obviously is, has a, a large and at the moment rising budget, so uh, that's fine, but many other donors are not in that position at the moment. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, big potential donors like China or India or Brazil or Mexico or Russia or the Gulf states don't actually give very much uh, in humanitarian aid or indeed in other kinds of aid. I mean, they have their own 
national problems. One has to accept that, and they deal with their own disasters. But they should be taking a bigger share of the burden for, uh, for international aid, including international humanitarian aid. They're beginning to do so, and I was certainly trying to persuade them to do so when I was at the United Nations. But you know, we need to engage them more. We need to broaden the, 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 the donor base, share the burden much more than we do now. Do now. So I think that, that will be very important. The second thing is if they, you know, we already see there's a, a, a large number of people in the humanitarian aid game, if I can call it that, who are not the traditional players. So you have a lot more Islamic NGOs uh, from Turkey and elsewhere. You have the Red Crescent organizations from the Gulf. Um, you know, and you, they don't form part of the consensus, as it were, about the principles I was talking about. So they may be giving valuable aid, but they may be doing it in ways we wouldn't necessarily approve of ourselves because they're, not, you know, they're, not, they're doing it for political reasons and not because of, uh, because of the, the need on the ground. Uh, and that poses a real dilemma. I think what we have to do is to talk to them, yeah. um, to try to explain why we think it needs to be done in that way, uh, and to try and you know, bring them into the system, which may mean we need to change ourselves. You know, we can't expect to stay the same. You have a broader spectrum of people in. So there's quite a lot of challenges there, but I think the, you know, the, there's, there's a good side that more actors are there. There's a, there's a more tricky side, which is, are they going to respect the same principles that we think are important? Mm. Lady here in the front. Um, Wait for the microphone. Sophie Steele. Um, I was going to ask more specifically... Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Sophie Steele, BlackRock. Okay. Um, I was going to ask more specifically how you see the role of the Chinese developing over the mm. future and how their philosophy perhaps differs to those in the West. Mm. Well, I mean, I, again, I hope China will become, you know, a significant um, humanitarian donor um, and a significant player in the discussions about humanitarian aid. Now, as I say, China, you know, China is a very disaster-prone country with huge yes. internal problems. Mm -hmm. uh, they have massive flooding every year. They have huge earthquakes. You know, they, they have just about everything, droughts as well, which they deal with without wanting any uh, outside aid. Sometimes there's a little tiny bit, but it's really not because they don't want it for political reasons, but they don't need it. They have you know, the resources to deal with it. So um, I think it's you know, reasonable to accept that they're not going to be a donor in the same way that rich, stable, non-disaster-prone countries like Britain or the United States or, or Germany or whatever might be. But I think they do need to contribute more. They should be more part of the international system, not only in this area, but in general. You know, they, they want to be a big player that has costs and responsibilities as well as opportunities for them, so we need to, to draw them into this. I say, when you draw them into the, uh, it goes back to what I was saying before, when you draw them into the political debate, they will have sometimes different views from our, our views. Uh, and we'll need to accommodate that uh, and you know, maybe come out with a slightly different consensus at the end of the day. But it's very important to, to bring them in. You know, they are operating to some extent as an international donor now. They were, when the Haiti earthquake ha uh, happened in 2010, they did give aid and they gave some of it unusually through, through the UN or through um, in even NGO channels, which they, I think, had not done before, mm. as opposed to giving money to the government, which in humanitarian terms we, we don't really usually see as a good idea because you never know what happens to the money. You know, and that's what right. happens with some of the Gulf states give money direct to the Pakistan government. I mean, I'm not singling them out particularly, but they will never know where it actually went at the end of the day. Um, another, another former colleague from the UN. I'm Andrew Whitley from the Elders Foundation, formerly with the UN. Um, I'd like to ask you, Sir John, about the situation in Syria today, mm. and particularly um, about how to keep the humanitarian space open. I was at a meeting earlier today where one of the speakers who knows Syria well was arguing that the humanitarian space, if I can use that jargon, um, um, is rapidly shrinking and could disappear within a couple of months, at the same time that the prospects for um, worsening of the humanitarian situation are very stark and, and likely to, to become dramatically worse. There's a, a contradiction between that need to keep the space open and to preserve access to the most vulnerable, and at the same time the Western-driven policy, which is that of uh, changing Assad's calculus through a variety of means of pressure, whether those are diplomatic, political, military, financial, etc. So reducing incentive for him to cooperate with the UN in that situation. I wonder what your advice would be, I mean, and you're well placed to do it, given that you were a former advisor to British Prime Ministers and to, to Ban Ki-moon, to, to keeping that space open and at the same time trying to pursue the, the, the broader political objective. 
Can I just add one little thing to Andrew's question, which is uh, the Prime Minister made it fairly clear a few days ago, and the French have also done so, that the question of actually delivering arms to the opposition is um, perhaps very close uh, and might be something that London and Paris would agree on. Well, I mean, I think you know, it, it is a very tricky situation, um, obviously. Um, I think so far, uh, although there's not enough aid reaching people in Syria or indeed the refugees outside Syria, um, it, it's been managed reasonably well in the sense that the, the UN, um, my successor Valerie Amos, has managed to maintain some kind of relationship um, with the Syrian government in Damascus, uh, as has UNHCR and Antonio Guterres. So they have been able to deliver a bit of aid, not enough certainly, and under very strict conditions uh, in this sort of areas which are still controlled by the government. So there's a certain amount of, of, of assistance been continued to be given, and, and the, 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 the Damascus government have not stopped that, despite the fact that you know, the, the, the international community generally is not exactly in a position of great benevolence towards that regime. I mean, the Security Council hasn't done anything for different reasons, but, but still, uh, you, know, you, you might have expected that, the, that, that uh, Assad and his government would have cut off these relations, and they haven't so far. But it might happen in the future, and if we get things like uh, a more obvious intervention by Western countries in giving aid to the rebels or a no-fly zone or whatever it might be, I think that will get much trickier. But at the same time as that's happening, uh, you have got... Um, you know, links have been established between different aid organizations and the rebels, I mean, mainly NGOs, and there's been quite a sort of good division of labor between the UN dealing with the government and the NGOs dealing with the, with the rebels. So there is an increasing flow of aid to the rebel-held areas th across the Jordan border, across the Turkish border, I think maybe a bit through Lebanon, but Lebanon mm. is very tricky yeah. for, uh, yeah. in, this, in this respect. So, you know, the, the, even if... Even if Assad said, no, I'm throwing you all out, as, as he might well do at some stage, and I'm not doing this anymore because I think you're all fifth columnists or whatever he might say, there would still be aid coming in through the, the rebel-held areas. Now that, you know, and as they achieve more control of more territory, um, that might become a little bit easier than it has been so far. Now, it's to, as I say, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean, frankly, uh, what's actually getting in there, but that will be the alternative way of continuing to do it, even if the government does cut it off. But for the moment, I think you know, it's right that Valerie Amos should continue to talk to the government, whatever she may feel personally about, uh, about Assad and what his government are doing. And that, you know, that is the sort of, as you know very well, that's the principle yeah. on which we should operate. The gentleman over here on the right. Michael Roberts, Chatham House member. Um, you said that you very nearly became Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, and I'd like to ask you a little about how the UN itself works, and in particular, the co coordination, or lack of coordination, if you like, between Good the question. various agencies. Uh, if you take a country in, in Central Asia, for example, you might well find 18, 19 different UN agencies operating out of different buildings on budgets uh, of uh, varying sizes, reporting to different capitals. And taking the example that you gave of Kabul, where Ocha decided to move out of the main UN mission, I wonder if you could sort of tell me how uh, uh, you feel about uh, a lack of internal coordination in the UN. To the donor community, it must be hugely frustrating, 12 governments, as you say, uh, finding that it spawns all these different agencies doing different things with different objectives, different leadership. And also for recipient governments, too, who find it very difficult to make sense of what the UN's trying to do in their patch. What's the answer to that? Before you answer that, John, let's take one other last question from the gentleman here. Yes. Um, thank you. I'm Sean McGuire. I work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, so thank you very much for the hat tip earlier on. Um, <laughs> talking, going back to, to Syria... Um, and that this issue of whether you can really have a political UN and a humanitarian UN working side by side. Um, if you cast your mind back to last year when the UN had uh, sort of monitors on the ground and at the same time various UN agencies were trying to deliver humanitarian aid and obviously the monitors, there was quite a political presence they had there. So my question I suppose is, is it utopian really to think you can ever properly have a, a, a distinct humanitarian UN that can, that can project its neutrality and act 
independently and impartially. Two very good questions to end with. Yes. John, you've got the answers. <laughs> Not sure I have the answers, otherwise I'd be better placed than I, would, I am. Um, I, I am in favour, actually, obviously, of much better UN coordination and, um, and systematic working together with different agencies. I think there are occasions when the humanitarian community needs to be separate, but that doesn't mean I think the rest of the UN shouldn't be much more closely integrated than it is. Mm -hmm. um, and you're absolutely right that there are a lot of agencies with overlapping mandates and the, the independent boards and all the rest of it who are doing different things. Now, they, you know, there are mechanisms to coordinate. There was a figure called the UN resident coordinator in every country whose job it is to try and bring them all together, and that works more or less well. The problem has been recognized, um, and there was a major um, effort after a high-level panel reported on this to try to, you know, it was called the One UN Initiative, I think, to try and bring all these agencies, and uh, not to merge their activities because that would be simply too difficult for this uh, stage, but at least to make sure that they were really were, they had a common funding and they had a common sort of program in a country, uh, which didn't drive the local government mad by having to deal with all these different agencies, as you say. And in some pilot countries, I think Vietnam was one and the one or two African countries, it did begin to make a bit of a difference. But I'm afraid it's rather run into the sand and hasn't been generalized. You know, and there is a problem that the agencies, you know, not because they're badly intentioned, but they, they do like to keep themselves independent. And of course, the international community keeps on creating more agencies and never abolishes any of them, so you get more and more in a sense. Um, no, so so you know, unless there's a really sort of radical uh, attempt to, to rationalize the, the agencies and to say there's only one UN operation in, in the country and the agencies can feed into it, but it's only one, you know, one f funding stream and, and one project, I think we're going to go on with these, with these problems, however unsatisfactory it might be. Um, but, you know, I say the problem is recognized. I think one of the issues, I actually do touch on this in the book, is that there is no, on the development side, there is no neutral organization which can coordinate them. They are supposed to be coordinated by the UN Development Program, the UNDP, but that is itself an operational agency. Therefore, the other agencies don't accept its coordinating role. Contrast that with the humanitarian side, where OCHA, you know, for all its faults, was relatively neutral. Uh, it wasn't an operational agency in its own right and therefore wasn't seen as a threat to the others. So it actually worked rather better, I think, uh, than it does on the development side. So actually establishing a neutral coordinating agency would be one step, but the you know, yeah. you know, it's, it's just not really on the agenda for the moment, I, I fear. Um, your question, about is it utopian to, to, to have the UN you know, with a political wing, as it were, and a humanitarian wing, and how can you expect people to keep them separate in circumstances like the one you're describing? Well, I, you know, it is a real problem. I mean, I, I, I don't have a magic answer to that. Uh, I mean, you know, it has been suggested that, well, maybe the UN should get out of humanitarian aid altogether, um, and then you, know, you could let the Red Cross and, and the NGOs do it. But I'm, I, you know, that would have all sorts of other problems. Because you know you do have very large agencies in the UN, which you know, are extremely important: the World Food Program, UNHCR, UNICEF, and so on. You know, with big resources and big impact on the ground. You know, what are you going to do with them? I mean, they can't simply give up that activity. I think because it won't be replaced by anybody else. And for a lot of countries, uh, you know, a lot of countries, as you know, are very suspicious of NGOs because they say, who are, they, who are these people? You know, who are they accountable to? What gives them the right to come to my country and tell me how I should run myself? Whereas they will accept, in some cases, that the UN has a, because of its univers universality and legitimacy, has a role that can then be played by the United Nations. So and it, and it, if it wasn't the UN coordinating the humanitarian activity, who would do it? Mm -hmm. um, I know an NGO can't really do that. The Red Cross can't and wouldn't want to. So, you know, you, you do fall back on having the UN and, and this rather messy situation. So, you know, my answer is it, it is messy. It's not perfect. You, you know, to imagine a, a perfect separation is a bit utopian, but there isn't a choice and we have to make the best of it, which is why we have to make these really strenuous efforts to, to distinguish the humanitarian from the rest and hope we can do it as best we can and, and, and you know, not give up. Because the argument is, you know, the argument is often used by the peacekeepers and the political side of the UN, you know, you're wasting your time, you know, forget it. But I mean, you can't forget it. We need to just try harder. Very good. Uh, alas, time has uh, run out on us. Um, I have one last announcement to make. There's a ballot box by the, uh, the front door.
um, where you can cast votes for the uh, Chatham House Prize uh, for 2013. So if you want to do that, please do. Uh, and finally, could you join me in thanking Sir John Holmes um, for his uh, very thoroughgoing review of uh, uh, humanitarian operations at which he was at the heart of them uh, for the last four years. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.